So welcome back to our friends. Good morning to all of you. As you know, uh, today we have a very uh, important lecture uh, by the authority, I can say the authority in the world and a unique authority in the country for the biodiversity uh, uh, related regulations. Uh, the lecture is by Dr. Vinod uh, B. Mathur, the chairperson of the National Biodiversity Authority, uh, which is a statutory body under the Government of India, uh, Ministry of Environment and Forest. Uh, friends, as you know, uh, it's a very important uh, lecture series. And uh, under this uh, lecture series, which is being uh, organized for a very noble cause, and that is uh, a proud moment for every Indian, and that is to... Uh, celebrate the 75 years of uh, our glory, uh, our glorious uh, achievements, I can say, uh, of India's independence. And for that, uh, uh, as I'm already, uh, I have already uh, told many times, uh, the ICR has taken up many activities. And uh, one of these activities being uh, the 75 uh, lectures by eminent persons, like the one we will have today. Uh, for the sake of uh, reminding all of you, I can just say that in the past, uh, most of you have attended the lectures. They have been by, uh, by uh, the experts uh, in different fields, uh, including uh, the agriculture research, agriculture policy, uh, the health-related issues, COVID issues, uh, yoga, uh, the, uh, the motivational lectures, and many more. Uh, so, uh, in the same series, uh, this lecture uh, is also very important uh, for uh, today's talk. And uh, uh, just uh, to remind you uh, the brief achievements, uh, Dr. Mathur is a well-known person, doesn't require much introduction, but let me just uh, briefly uh, tell uh, uh, or briefly introduce uh, Dr. Mathur uh, for the benefit of our all uh, our audience which include uh, our vice chancellors, uh, the, the previous uh, uh, authorities, uh, we see Dr. R.B. Singh, we see Dr. Gautam, we see many directors, vice chancellors who are attending these lectures. Uh, so uh, friends, I can just briefly introduce uh, Dr. Mathur. Uh, Dr. Mathur, uh, as you know, he obtained his doctorate degree from the University of Oxford, uh, United Kingdom during 1991. Uh, after serving for 33 years at the prestigious Wildlife Institute of India, including as the Dean from 2005 to 2014, and subsequently as the Director of, uh, from 2014 to 2019, uh, Dr. Mathur was appointed as the 11th Chairperson of the National Biodiversity Authority on 1st September 2019. The NBA, as you all know, is a statutory body of the Government of India for providing advisory and regulatory services on all matters related to the biodiversity conservation and management. Uh, Dr. Mathur is the regional vice chair presently of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas and member of the International Association of Impact Assessment. Uh, Dr. Mathur has now spent over three decades in actively contributing to a wide range of training, research and academic programs in the field of biodiversity conservation. He has extensive experience as an international trainer and his special interests include natural resource conservation, heritage conservation, environmental and strategic impact assessment, and biodiversity informatics. Uh, Dr. Mathur has been actively contributing on research policy interface issues and has been the regional vice chair uh, Asia Pacific region of United Nations Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, multidisciplinary expert panel. He is currently the uh, UN IPBES Bureau member from 2019 to 2022, and also the UN CBD Bureau member. He is the co chair of IPBES Task Force on Policy, Support Tools, and Methodologies and member of the IPBES Task Force on Capacity Building. He has been the chair of the UN CBD Informal, Informal Advisory Group for developing synergies between seven biodiversity-related conventions. And he has been part of the official Indian delegation for CBD and UNESCO World Heritage Committee meetings since 2006, a very long period, and has in-depth knowledge about the working of these conventions. He possesses 
possesses an outstanding scholastic record coupled with strong leadership skills and networking capabilities. He has made significant contributions as a scientific administrator and in promoting scientific research in Australia through both publications and outreach programs in the field of biodiversity conservation. What a illustrious biodiversity, the contributions, achievement, and we are really delighted to listen uh, to Dr. Mathur and uh, our uh, our uh, eminent audience also, I can say, uh, Dr. P. L. Gautam, who has been earlier the uh, chairman of National Biodiversity Authority, he is also present. And I will request him to uh, uh, kindly chair this today's session. Professor R. B. Singh, who has been uh, at various key positions, uh, Director IRI, Chairman ASRB, and uh, international organizations. He is also one of the uh, audience uh, in uh, today's uh, uh, session. And I see many other eminent persons. So uh, I hope, uh, Dr. Mathur, uh, we all will be greatly benefited by this. And I again thank you very much for kindly act, uh, accepting our invitation. This important. We are having 75 uh, lectures, and the floor is yours. You can take uh, time, and then uh, maybe 10 minutes will be spent for uh, responding to the questions by the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathurs. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Can you see my slides yes. as well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very well. Okay. So, a very good morning to all my esteemed colleagues. It is very daunting to speak before such an illustrious audience. Dr. Gotham and all top scientists of the country, I would definitely try my best to present what I call as issues with biodiversity governance and what is the global perspective and what is the national perspective for us. Now, this uh, simple slide, which is before you, is just a person holding some soil. But there is a very important message there. As you can see in the text, Nature underpins and sustains human quality of life. See, we may belong to different sectors, forestry, agriculture, biodiversity, infrastructure, whatever, but nature is the same. And this soil, as you can see, there is some plant material, there is an earthworm, and there is a host of microorganisms in the soil. It will not be out of place for me to say the entire agriculture productivity, the entire horticulture productivity, the entire food productivity, and the entire forest productivity is dependent on soil. But we know that how much care we take for the soil. The point of presenting the soil, this slide is to begin with, to say that biodiversity is all encompassing. It is not just plant, it is not just animal, it is not just microorganism, it is not just people, it is a combination of all and we need to see what we are doing to it. The variability and variety as we see is well known, but this is the important point that nature's contribution to people are deteriorating. As you can see on the hand, the skin of the hand, you can see it has all the marks, all linings on that to indicate that all is not well. Now, this is an interesting graphic. You can see it sums up a 50 year old history from 1970 to 2022. On your left are contributions from nature. What we call now as nature's contribution to people, 18 of them. And on your right are the trends. And these are global trends from all the regions in the world, from Africa to Latin America to Asia. And everywhere we see the arrow is pointing downwards or southwards, meaning thereby that there is a decline. Whether we are talking in terms of freshwater quality, whether we are talking of regeneration of soil. So this is a very worrying picture, which scientists in the world, and I'm sure you are aware, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IBIS, which is the technical arm right now, has presented in its report that this is what are the global trends. So what is the bottom line? The fabric of life on Earth is deteriorating. See, our children, our fashionable children, 
they wear torn jeans and torn clothes as a mark of fashion but life is not fashion as you can see the threads which you can see you recall our mothers and sisters they use a stitch and a thread to put together anything which gets torn and same example is with earth the fabric of life is breaking it is anybody's guess how long these threads will hold the fabric maybe a few years a few months but this is the picture which is emerging same thing is this fabric is getting smaller it is getting frayed and in scientific terms all indicators of the global state of nature are decreasing so this is i am afraid a very worrying picture before us and this picture is a global picture it is not for india not for asia not for africa but for all regions in the world we are not doing what is required to be done for nature so what are we doing we are doing everything which is not to be done for biosphere 75% of the land area is altered 66% of the ocean area is altered and a whopping 85% of wetlands have been lost you can well imagine if fresh water wetlands are lost what is going to be the impact let me now come back to species and species extinction on your left you see that these are the different taxonomic group where species are threatened with extinction i want to draw your attention to the lines colored in yellow in orange and red red is critically endangered orange is endangered and yellow is vulnerable so this is what is a broad picture that we get different taxonomic groups are affected differently but i am afraid all of them are affected and see what this little tiny frog is saying that global extinction rates are now tens and hundreds of times higher than what they have been and we are now talking of not one two but 10 million years it's a whole time scale that we are talking that these extinction rates are going up let us see where these rates are going up this is the graphic so see cumulative percentage of species that have become extinct and you can see top of the line are amphibians followed by mammals followed by birds followed by reptiles and fishes and see the bottom line as well all these years between 1500 and 1900 the rates of extinctions were less but see what happens after 1900 these rates are shooting up and that is what we need to be worried as scientists as resource managers as policy makers as administrators that we need to do something of course we cannot stop extinction but definitely we can look at the anthropogenic rate of extinctions that you and i are contributing the importance of local varieties i am sure as agriculture scientists very eminent you have dealt all through your life we know what is the local variety what is the local breed and how important they are whether it is corn or whether it is cattle these breeds are now disappearing and today in this era of climate change what is going to get affected are these local breeds because they have been locally adapted if the local temperature changes if the local moisture changes if the local soil condition changes local rainfall changes then these species and varieties are going to get affected so i'm sorry that i'm presenting a very very difficult and dismal picture but that is also a reality it is a wake up call for us that we need to take and review our actions so even sounding a little dramatic i am saying that our planet is collapsing and we know what collapse means extinction rates are high populations of major species are declining and this ibis assessment that i talked about it is saying that up to 1 million species of both plant and animal are going to get affected if we continue the business as usual so what have we failed we have failed to address the critical challenges 
You remember for the last 20, 25, 30 years, we have been talking that we must not break the ceiling of 1.5 degrees C and the global warming effects are going to come. But there are already now signs, look at the recent uh, IPCC report, that there are all indications that there is going to be a rise or break of this barrier of 1.5 degree. We are already into the six mass extinction and there is a 60% decline or over 60% decline in the vertebrate populations in the world. So this is all a very worrisome picture. And we know that poverty, much of us living in the developing world, understand what poverty is and what and how poverty is linked to both nature and climate. And if the natural processes change, if the climate changes, then we are going to get more and more into poverty and poverty-like situations over there. So let us look at the economic development, the models of economic development. Every country wants to develop, including us. We are talking of one, two, three, four trillion economy. But if that economic development takes place at the cost of ecology or environment, it is well clear that it is not going to augur well for all of us. So it is time that we need to look at the economic model. We need to see that uh, if this economic model is destroying our planet, then we need to revise it. We need to review it. We need to look at alternatives over there. Very interestingly, uh, many of you know that every year in early January, the top leaders in the business world descends on a place called Davos in Switzerland. And these business magnates discuss that what are the risks to their business. Obviously, as a business, I would be concerned to look at my fate of my business. And for the first time in 2020, just two years back, the World Economic Forum accepted that there is going to be a financial risk to global economy if nature is lost. This was the first time admission that nature's loss is going to affect the economy, it is going to affect the politics, it is going to affect everything. So this is, I would say, a very important milestone in the way in which businesses operate because they are dependent on nature, they are dependent on biological diversity, and if the biological diversity is not maintained or not managed, then we run into difficulties over there. So we know that these are the 17 sustainable development goals. We have done a lot of mapping. Individually, we look at these goals and we say, okay, we want to reduce poverty. We want to have green city. We want to have an urban um, uh, wealth and so on. But this study is showing that as many as 10 sustainable development goals out of 17 are dependent on nature. If we do not take care of nature, then it will be almost impossible to meet these goals of sustainability. You are all esteemed agriculture scientists involved in supporting and promoting food production. But the evidence is now coming up that the kind of agriculture that we do, the kind of unsustainable practices that we follow, I'm not saying all, but some of them, they can have a negative impact on the environment, on the nature, on the soil. And these are figures which are saying that we need to look at one more time the developments in agriculture, how we can make those changes. Already people are talking about eco-generative agriculture. We need to be more sensitive towards the development. Agriculture will remain the mainstay of our economy, but we need to give a place for meeting the biodiversity concerns as well. So these are something which uh, we need to, need to look at it and uh, uh, be very careful on that. Oh, my slide is getting stuck. Oops. Okay. Okay. So now this is something very important. I talked about loss of wetlands. Nature's loss, it affects both water quality and quantity. And we are concerned with both. We want wells not to dry up, our streams not to dry up, our rivers not to dry up. 
we are also concerned that they don't get polluted so we need to take steps to ensure that water quality and quantity is not affected and that is where we need to review our practices whether they are in forestry whether they are in agriculture or whether they are in biodiversity now this is something i want to spend a minute or two we have all seen the last 3 years in the pandemic now that there are signs of pandemic receding but let us see what caused this pandemic it is true that the 2019 pandemic we were all taken by surprise but what is the learning from that what is that the world needs to take call we now understand that there are diseases which are called zoonotic which are spread from animal to animal first and then from animal to human and there is a possibility that more and more such zoonotic diseases will emerge in the coming years if look on the right what we are doing we are cutting our forests we are increasing the antimicrobial resistance we are looking at uh, um, uh, fires uncontrolled fires and we are converting our lands into infrastructure so this is what not that this covid was something uh, which uh, uh, cannot be controlled or cannot be managed but we need to take steps now 19 we were caught off guard i agree but now in 2021 20, 22 what is the guarantee that there will not be another pandemic and you know how variants are working somewhere it is omicron somewhere it is something else so we need to look at nature this is the nature's call or a wake up call that we need to be more responsive we need to be more careful in the way nature operates and that is where you can see the biodiversity loss is now being rated as a top 5 threats few years back when biodiversity scientists when scientists like you and me were talking about conservation nobody was believing us everybody said that conservation is a luxury which we cannot afford we have human needs to fulfill but this is what is the projection this is what is the evidence that top 5 threats for humanity are biodiversity loss and the infrastructure the energy the extractive industry the mining that we do i am not saying that we need to stop everything i cannot do that i cannot say that but we need to look at the balance between conservation and development we need to ensure that our development ambitions are fully backed up by conservation imperatives so unless we do that we will not be able to move ahead with our programs of uh, uh, sabka saath and sabka vikas because some of the elements will get affected so therefore we need to look at our current pattern of development which i do not hesitate to say that is apparently unsustainable there are limits to growth nature is not infinite the resources are not infinite they may appear to be but that is not true so we need to find solutions in which we are able to protect and preserve nature interestingly see the title of the slide the science is very clear many times when we talk to politicians they say are humko iska nahi pata humko ye nahi pata humko wo nahi pata hum kaise decision lenge but that is not fully true you can see the science and the scientific evidence is there and we cannot continue to destroy nature there is a biodiversity collapse there is a sixth mass extinction there is a financial risk i have already said that how sdgs are getting affected and we need to address the drivers of change the real change will come when we look at the drivers and these drivers are not out of the planet they are if i can say so anthropogenic in origin you and i are equally responsible for these actions and therefore we need to introspect and see what steps we need to take and do that and therefore we are now talking of uh, again our call for conserving nature now looking at a new deal for nature and people see this is a new term which is being discussed at the global level that we need a new deal a new deal means we need to look at our own steps 
the earlier business as usual is not working our economy and ecology is not protected and therefore we need to look at the new deal i'll very briefly explain what this new deal is because this is a fact nature is fundamental to human kind we are totally dependent on actions and stewardship the leadership has to be provided by humans the animals and plants are the affected parties they cannot provide leadership but you and i have to come to the front to develop the leadership skills and be the stewards of environment i picked up the slide globally every often we hear the fires raging in united states in florida in california these are warning signs that nature is in the red we need to look at our water our soils our pollinators the livelihoods is getting destroyed and the climatic patterns are changing there will be more tsunamis there will be more floods there would be stochastic events and that is where we need to be worried about to take steps on that interestingly half of the global domestic product the gross domestic product is dependent on nature forestry sector is worth 583 billion dollars fisheries are another 150 pollinators we understand so all these things we are now trying to put up an economic tag see till few years back we were not able to say that what will be the loss to nature fortunately our economists our environmental and ecologists and ecological economists have come together there is a famous das gupta report the economics of biodiversity produced a year ago very clearly says that we need to protect nature's capital if we don't do that then things are going to change things are going to get affected over there so agriculture is at the heart of food production to the point of repetition to this august esteemed audience we need to look at soil and water conservation techniques yes we want to have doubling of crops and doubling of everything but at the same time healthier soils are needed unless our top soils get protected unless we prevent erosion unless we develop and implement heterogeneous crop approaches and we'll get into local and sustainable production things are not going to happen in the way we like it to happen i already made a point that we need to protect nature so that we get clean water how long can we survive on mineral water bottles and artificial sources even now we are saying that even ro water is not good so we need to be doubly careful on what we are doing to nature what we are doing to fresh water this is a very interesting slide what happens when you conserve or protect nature the for very important for the politician it leads to job creation that is where the politician's interest is if we tell the politician that by protecting nature it can create jobs so there are examples that global forestry is employing so many million people we are also talking of ecosystem services these services whether these are of pollination carbon sequestration or whatever is doing but the third circle is very important for every dollar invested in nature there is a likely return of 9 dollars see this kind of a return is nowhere possible we may invest in gold we may invest in buying dollars but this return you will never get so these are some of the new facts which are coming today we talk of evidence based decision making evidence based policy formulation and this simple slide can convince i am very confident our politician and our decision maker that if you protect in nature your economic growth is ensured your jobs are secured you can create more jobs market you can protect the ecosystem services you can convert them into monetary value and for every dollar that this country or the world will spend we will get a return of 9 dollars so what i am making a plea i am making a plea that nature has to be at the heart of our economic model no development no vikas that we talk of can happen if we do not care about our nature or our prakriti 
that is what is the message and the bottom line that prakriti has to be the at the center of every model of development every model of economics so therefore we need to find a path that puts nature climate and people right now they are pitted against each other nature versus climate climate versus nature climate versus people people versus climate we need to understand that we need to live within the planetary boundaries scientists have given this concept that we must live within the planetary boundaries we must their climate and people at the same thing it is not that when we talk of climate it is only the climate convention which needs to deal with it when we talk of biodiversity it is the biodiversity convention which needs to deal and when we talk of land it is land degradation this is a fallacy this is something which the world is now increasingly realizing actions are still to come that we need to look at a complete and a holistic view which is there and unless we do that we will not be able to move ahead on that so finally i want to say these are the scenarios for resource conservation you can see this dark green line if the business as usual continues if you and i and all our policy and decision makers do not take any step then loss of nature is there but we can change the trajectory of this curve see this light green line on the top these changes are possible but these changes are possible when we take steps and what are these steps these steps are steps for restoration for green infrastructure investment in natural capital bringing in innovations in agriculture also reducing our consumptions see our consumption levels are very high we may say that they are lower than united states or the developing north or the, the developed north but the fact is that these are very high nature cannot sustain these consumption levels we need to look at our entire gamut of subsidies i do understand there is a role for subsidies there is a need for agriculture subsidies but here what i am talking of are what are called as perverse subsidies subsidies that harm nature that is where we need to look at world is saying eliminate subsidy india is very strongly arguing at the global level that we cannot use the word eliminate we can reform them we can repurpose them and that is what the stand as we go in the climate and biodiversity negotiations we are saying that these are necessities we need to look at better governance model we need to look at better regulation so there is uh, there is a hope there is a possibility and i am very sure if you and i and our police continue to work we can change the trajectory of this curve we can bend this curve as people are saying by taking steps which are required here so ultimately what is our goal we are already into 2022 we now need to look at how can we be nature positive by 2030 so what you see in this graphic there are goals so we know what what we want to achieve we need to protect we need to restore we need to safeguard and we need to reduce the consumption and other levels by half on your left is the problems so it's not just wishful thinking we have now gone into problems that what is the problem analysis so and now our scientists and colleagues have said that these are the solutions so we now know the goals we now know the problems we now know the solutions what is that we are waiting for we need to have a larger engagement of people and that is what uh, these lecture series which icr has so carefully planned i was very impressed to see the kind of people who have come and lectured much before me and much better than me but these are some of the things which we need to do take the resolve then only we can get a new deal for people and planet finally what i say we have dramatically reconfigured the fabric of life the world is definitely more interconnected but the world is also unequal the gap between have and have nots the gap between the developed north and the developing south is increasing 
So therefore, we need to take a resolve that we must not further deteriorate nature and planet. We must try to do and take steps to reduce this. And then only we can think of that we have a better future. We will have a, a kind of a nature which everybody can take pride of. And I'm sure uh, my colleagues will agree that uh, we need to invest more in nature, politically, socially, economically, and by mindset. So I will stop here. And if there are some comments and questions, I would be very willing to take them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mathur. Uh, excellent talk uh, and excellent facts uh, you have uh, projected. I think they are very uh, disturbing. Uh, we have to just uh, take care of the nature, our mother earth. And uh, we have to take the message that uh, the nature, climate and people have to be in this synergy. We, we cannot afford uh, that uh, any kind of imbalance is there. We have to take care of the soil uh, and uh, water conservation. We have to take care of uh, uh, many things related to the nature. Uh, and especially for the agriculture, uh, the ICR takes full care. Uh, that uh, the the uh, the ecosystem is not disturbed, and uh, that's what uh, the, the new varieties, the new technologies are being developed, uh, taking care of all uh, the use of all kind of technologies. Uh, especially now, you see the lot of uh, use of IOTs, uh, the precision agriculture, so that we uh, have all kind of uh, resource optimization and every kind of thing we do. Now, uh, Dr. Mathur sahab, we have a few questions, uh, like uh, I can just tell you, uh, there is a question by Dr. Sunil Archer. Uh, what about the uh, self-healing capacity of the nature? Uh, have we destroyed uh, that too? <laughs> Dr. Sunil Archer is working uh, at NBPJR uh, as a principal scientist. No, thank you very much for pointing that out. I wish we would have not destroyed the self-healing regenerative capacity of the earth. But there are indications that we are doing that. Adding chemicals, adding pesticides, adding things which should not be there. So yes, nature can heal. Nature can take care of itself. You remember when we have this big avian of cleaning the Ganga. And everybody says that the water and the Ganges water has a self-regenerative capacity. But our scientific studies at WI were clearly pointing that that capacity is getting compromised. It is getting impaired. Not that it has disappeared. So this is what your point is very valid. If we take care of nature, nature will take care of you. And yeah. if you recall the logo of my own ministry, I, uh, it says that uh, uh, protect, uh, nature protects if she is protected. See, yeah, these five sure. words, <laughs> they sum up everything, the discourse of entire thing that we are having today. But are we doing it? That is my question. We need to introspect that what is the harm, what is the danger, what is the loss we ourselves. And therefore, every report, whether it is IPCC or IPBIS, is pointing out that it is the anthropogenic reasons or factors which are responsible for destroying or affecting nature. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur uh, Dr. S uh, uh, Madam Salini Bhutani, you know, uh, she is uh, putting a question. Yes, please. Uh, two questions. Uh, and she says uh, that since this talk has two dimensions, uh, the global, given the worldwide uh, biodiversity crisis, how uh, should India deal with CBD non-parties such as USA, especially with the new global biodiversity framework, uh, on the uh, horizon, and the national is uh, any reflections on the biodiversity amendment bill 2021 and its relevance for a new uh, new biodiversity governance. Very okay. relevant questions. Yeah, two very important questions. Everybody is very unhappy all these years of US not being party to the convention. We can only say that at the international level, we are trying our best to persuade that. I should not say, but will say that small changes are visible. Look at the attitude of Trump administration and look at the way in which the new Biden administration is dealing with climate issues. So there is hope. There is hope. The hope needs to be translated into action. But uh, I, I, I say that uh, 
while it will be good for us to sign it but even if they don't sign there are many steps which they can take to ensure that climate and emissions which are causing the loss are contained and a unified way is taken up and what the south is asking technology access to technology access to capacity at least that can be provided on the second question of amendment well you are aware that the government has brought in amendment last december it is being discussed in the parliament there are many things which uh, uh, the the act came into being in 2002 now we are into 2022 many things have changed many things have changed the science itself has changed if i can give you one example 20 years back when we said conventional breeding it had a different connotation today even our farmer is also applying certain methods to improve that so i would say in a, in a, in a few months time we should be able to see that what these implications are going to be we need to look at a, a hopeful future and we need to keep our hope alive i would say that we will have a better governance model we should be able to respond to whatever challenges we are saying at the global level these have to be matched up at the national level thank you thank you dr mathur uh, there is another question uh, what could be the possible mechanism uh, to keep account of gains and losses in initial assets along with annual uh, economic measures and the gdp of the nation Uh, this is a question by dr anurag agarwal so dr agarwal see things have changed in the last 5 years if i can say so look at the current work of the ministry of statistics and program implementation which has been tasked in monitoring the progress of india as far as the 17 sdgs are concerned look at the new reports which are coming in look at the way that the uni biological scientists are now trying to make an effort with economists and i mentioned to you the report the famous report of das gupta who is of course of indian origin but studied in england has come up with that that uh, the nature's capital is what we need to ensure if this message is put across everyone and if this message is implemented then we will not run after produced capital we will look at we need to look at two things we need to look at the natural capital and we need to look at the social capital and that is where my scientific colleagues know that we are now talking of a new socio ecological framework this is the framework which is being talked about because it talks about biodiversity it talks about ecosystem services it talks about landscapes it talks about people so we need to also change ourselves and to change from our silo approaches to our larger approaches as we say to quote the prime minister sabka saath sabka vikas then only we will think of having an atmanirbhar bharat otherwise all these will remain as a pipe dream true that is true sir uh, now uh, may i request uh, uh, dr bharucha uh, dr bharucha you know he is a nature lover and yeah, yeah. professor uh, he is a medical doctor he is my mentor Dr. Dr. I had the opportunity to work with him uh, in a number of committees uh, in the National Biodiversity Authority, and uh, he is a well-known. I think he is connected with this Salim Ali also, uh, his family, and he looks like Salim Ali. <laughs> so, Dr. Barucha, yes, uh, you have uh, any point to make? Uh, thank you, Agarwal sir. Great to see you this morning, and of course, we will be wonderful to see you at on this. stage here i have two points really which have always uh, which have always worried me and with view for, and for everything that you have said today we have had long communications about this how are we going to convince our policy makers that's so very crucial and the second is have we sufficiently put this into formal educational processes at all levels from school college university uh, these are the two things i think which will we we will get a larger number of people with us and somehow we have not really been able to do that at least my generation has failed your generation has been a bit better i think but it was my generation that failed to do this 
And, and, and that's where the ill began. Can you help us with this? Sir, uh, as far as the politician is concerned, there is no magical solution, but we keep trying. You have spent all your years, I'm not saying 80 or 85, but all your years you have spent, and I have done mine too, and everybody in this audience has done. The only thing is we need two things. We need to have evidence. See, that was my learning for 30 years that I spent in WII, that scientific evidence is very critical. Our science has to be very strong when we talk of effects or impacts or anything. So if the science is strong, then you can communicate better. So two, two things, our scientists, agriculture, forestry, biodiversity, they should produce hard evidence and people like you and me <laughs> on that evidence and try to communicate as often as possible. Your other point is also very valid. What are we doing to the children? What are we doing to the youth? And I must say that uh, very recent, uh, it's too early to judge, but the new national education policy calls for a change. It is talking of many things. I will say one interesting thing, at least for myself, when I was in class nine, I was making projects. And for making my project, I was relying on my mother and my sister. I prepare something so that I can submit in my botany class, in my zoology class. Today, what the new policy is saying, take these children out. Take them to garden, urban, rural, wherever you are. Make them see things. Make them identify 10 plants, 20 animal species. And Dr. Barucha, I am confident that slowly and slowly, as we move along in this direction, we will have a new generation of people who will then come much better empowered than what at least I was 30, 40 years back. So I am very optimistic and I'm very hopeful that uh, you and I need to be the torch bearers of providing that opportunity. You are aware that how in NBA and WII we are running an internship program. Any young student who has a degree, no experience can come and join, work for a year see for himself or herself what nature has to offer. Then these people will be our champions. That is the hope I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parusha. And thanks, Dr. Mathur, for responding to this important question. Uh, just, uh, I'll take one more question, and uh, then I'll ask uh, Dr. Gautam to uh, give his remarks. Uh, the question is by Dr. Parimalan who is working at uh, NBPGR, National Bureau of Plants and Resources, that uh, how the Russia-Ukraine conflict has the impact on the biodiversity? Uh, is there any assessment so that it becomes a lesson for all others across the world? Sir, in the two debates uh, that I have attended in Geneva very recently, the discussion was not so much on its impact. It was dominated by politics, whether Russia should be allowed to speak or whether Ukraine will be allowed to speak. So unfortunately, at the global level, you know how geopolitics work. There will be definitely impacts on the ground, which are all for, for us to see. These are very, very important economic resources in Russia and in Ukraine and so on. Uh, I must tell you some very interesting thing. Uh, two days back, I went, it, went to take a yellow fever shot. I'm going to Nairobi tomorrow. So I asked, they said that all the uh, yellow fever vaccine comes from Russia. And there has been no supply for the last three to four months ever since this war break out. So these are economic effects are being felt first. Then will come ecology. Then will come biodiversity and agriculture and so on and so forth. So these effects, anything which happens at the global level will affect. But it is difficult for me at this point to say what the impacts on conservation or biodiversity would be. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Uh, now, friends, as you know, uh, Dr. T.L. Gautam, uh, he has uh, worked as the chairman uh, of this National Biodiversity Authority. And uh, he is the only man who has uh, also served the, the another uh, authority, that is Protection of Plant Varieties and Farmer's Rights Authority. So, a, a, a only man who has uh, served both the authorities. 
and both deal with the biodiversity or regular biodiversity in a different uh, perspective. Uh, so we will request uh, Dr. Gautam, uh, 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 sir, please uh, give your uh, final remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grewal, for Sir, your connection is not Doctor आपको आवाज सुनाई दे रही है इनके नहीं सर नहीं सर आपकी सुनाई दे रही है इनकी नहीं दे रही हां यस सर हां जी सर आप बिना वीडियो के बोलिए आप सर ओके वेल इट वाज वंडरफुल टू हियर डॉक्टर माथुर ऑन दिस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक ही हैज गिवन अ वेरी गुड story about uh, how far we have uh, disturbed the biodiversity and the nature. And uh, he has alarmed about the catastrophic effects which are going to be faced by all of us. Uh, well, uh, he has uh, very nicely summarized the impacts which we are feeling by the loss of biodiversity or loss of nature, and uh, which is affecting our food production, the water quality, and also has some impact upon the genetic diseases. Uh, well, uh, he has uh, very nicely elaborated that uh, the new dimensions of uh, biodiversity relating to the economic development and how to really balance these two. Now he has indicated that protecting nature can be seen as uh, a sink for creating jobs, a very important reservoir for providing ecosystem services and also adding the adding to the net GDP of ours. Now, nature, when we mix it with the economic models, and now we say that nature plus developments should be encouraged by 2030. Now, this is a very important uh, challenge. First is that how to address the problems which he has very nicely elaborated. What are the goals to be set for that? And then what benefits we are going to get out of that? He has tried to make a good summary out of that uh, presentation. Uh, well, friends, we must remember that uh, in natural resources, especially the biodiversity, the whole global community is interdependent. So we have to interconnect ourselves for sharing the biodiversity. And that is why the Convention on Biological Diversity was adopted and which has three very important pillars, conservation and sustainable, conservation and sustainable development and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of use of biodiversity. Now, this is how the CBD as international treaty was adopted, and uh, it has a lot to do relating to our activities. India was one of the first countries to enact uh, the biodiversity legislation, imbibing the three important pillars of uh, conventional bio biological diversity. Much progress has been made in implementing it. There are, as uh, Dr. Mathur mentioned, we enacted the legislation in 2002, and we are now in 2022. And uh, there are a lot of changes, a lot of things have changed. And that is why the 
action regarding some amendment in the act is under the consideration of the parliament. Uh, well, uh, taking the whole presentation which Dr. Mathur made, he had uh, alarmed all of us to be very careful about our activities so that the environment is least affected. Now, this requires a lot of capacity building and awareness generation. The question raised was that how far we have been able to generate awareness amongst the common people. Not much. It's a huge task. And uh, I think this is where the different uh, agencies, academic institutions have to come forward and uh, see that the our next generation is made sensitized and uh, made responsible uh, along with the present generation to take care of the conservation of the environment and more particularly the biodiversity. Well, this uh, uh, lecture was uh, well clear and nicely delivered in very simple uh, uh, mode of uh, delivery. And uh, I really enjoyed his presentation. Uh, and uh, I hope all the uh, participants who have joined this uh, uh, event have benefited a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. And uh, thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for making me to make... Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, nicely summarizing and giving your comments. And uh, they are very... Uh, useful comments which you have given in your final remarks. We have to take care really of our environment and not to do any practice which affects or the cost of the environment. And Dr. Mathur has given a very clear message and it's a very useful information that investment of $1 can give you a return of $9. So you cannot get ninefold return and that too at the cost of our health, that too cost of our sustainability for which we talk always, anything we talk for sustainability, whether it's agriculture, ecosystem, or our growth, everything has to be sustainable. And for that, there cannot be any better investment than in the, in the ecosystem or in the environment. So thank you, uh, Dr. Mathusa, for giving a very clear message. And uh, we can take a place that we will not uh, do anything uh, which uh, uh, directly indirectly affects our environment. And uh, we have to also just uh, make our consistent effects, uh, consistent efforts, uh, so that uh, directly or indirectly we can contribute for the conservation and preservation of our uh, environment. Uh, maybe small steps we can take, but let us take some steps so that we can in true sense say that we have been benefited by this great lecture. So thank you, Dr. Mathur, uh, for you, enlightening us. Uh, and uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, for joining this. Namaskar, sir. Thank you, sir. Namaskar.